Sheffield Wednesday are a club in crisis. Ten games into the season, they have won just two points. It represents the club's worst ever start to a season since joining the Football League over 130 years ago and the joint worst start that any team has ever made in the entire history of the championship. The only other teams to have won none, drawn two, and lost eight of their opening ten championship fixtures were Bolton Wanderers in the 2017-18 season and Stoke City in 2019-20, both of whom, remarkably, actually managed to avoid relegation. Few anticipate that Sheffield Wednesday will follow in their footsteps this season, though, as the Owls' plight extends far beyond results. When Daypon Chancery bought Wednesday, the football club, not the day of the week, from Milan Mandaric in the summer of 2015, he outlined his ambition to reach the Premier League within the next two years, and he had no qualms about spending heavily to get there. Carlos Carvajal almost delivered promotion a year ahead of schedule, reaching the championship playoff final in both his and Chancery's first season at Hillsborough, where Wednesday lost 1-0 against Hull City. The following season, Chancery spent heavily again, and Wednesday climbed from 6th to 4th place, teeing up another all-Yorkshire playoff showdown, this time against Huddersfield Town in the semi-finals. The cruel mistress of penalties denied Wednesday and saw Huddersfield progress, who went on to win promotion to the Premier League at Wembley. Meanwhile, Wednesday have been a rudderless, chaotic, and crumbling mess ever since. No one can doubt Dapon Chancery's financial investment in Sheffield Wednesday, having paid £37.5 million to acquire the club, almost £40 million on players in his first three seasons alone, and competing with relegated Premier League clubs when it came to salaries. What they can doubt, however, is how that money has been spent, the way in which supporters have been milked in an effort to plug spending gaps, and the brainless way in which the club has been run over the last six years. Unfortunately, Daypon Chancery is a man who doesn't like to be questioned, let alone criticised, and following Wednesday's disastrous start to the current campaign, he recently wrote an extraordinary club statement in which he asked supporters what good they had done the club, extolled his own virtues, and announced that he wouldn't be putting any additional money into the club. For a club whose parent company, Sheffield 2 Limited, has lost over £65 million over the last three seasons alone, Chancery's tantrum may well prove catastrophic. Relegation is practically a given, as far as most Sheffield Wednesday fans are concerned, even with only a fifth of the season gone, but what follows threatens to be far worse. For a club that has won more than twice as many trophies as West Ham, has a stadium larger than 10 current Premier League teams, and a fan base that sells out away ends hundreds of miles away, even when they are practically guaranteed to see their own team lose, it is a pretty tragic set of circumstances. So sit back, relax, and join me on a journey to Sheffield the birthplace of modern football in many respects, for a deep dive into the arrogance and incompetence of Dapon Chancery, the impact it has had on arguably English football's biggest underachievers over the past 25 years, and why the future looks quite so bleak right now for Sheffield Wednesday. Last season was a rare ray of light during a dark few years for Sheffield Wednesday. Following relegation from the Championship, and heartbreak in the League One playoffs over the last two campaigns, Darren Moore was able to instill a real sense of togetherness at Hillsborough, from the players through to the fans. Dapon Chancery, who had become such a divisive figure in South Yorkshire, seemed to slink off into the sidelines as the team did the talking. In direct contrast to this season, the Owls enjoyed their best start to a campaign in over 30 years, and going into the last 12 games of the season, they were top of the division with two games in hand, having lost just three league games all season. Such a comprehensive winning mentality hasn't been in Sheffield Wednesday's DNA for an awfully long time. And sure enough, heading into the final straight, they decided to collapse. Wednesday failed to win any of their next six matches, including a 1-0 defeat against Forest Green Rovers, who were by far the worst team in the division, and won just six games all season. Plymouth Argyle and Ipswich Town, meanwhile, made no such mistakes, stealing in ahead of the Owls to secure automatic promotion. 
It must be said that with 96 points, Wednesday had by far the highest points tally of any team in the history of League One not to win automatic promotion, and it was a tally that would have won them not just promotion, but the League One title in any of the preceding four seasons. Nonetheless, for Wednesday Wednesdayites, it had that all-too-familiar feeling. Wednesday's recent playoff record could reasonably be described as suboptimal and, less generously, as atrocious. They were without a win in any of their last six playoff matches, and sure enough, not only did they lose the first leg of their playoff semi-final against Peterborough United, who finished a whopping 19 points behind them over 46 games in the league, they were thrashed 4-0. No team has ever come back from a more than three-goal deficit in the first leg of a playoff semi-final. Sheffield Wednesday weren't just dead and buried as far as most people were concerned then, including most of their own supporters, some of whom went viral on social media ripping up their tickets for the second leg. They had been cremated and their ashes scattered over the pitch at London Road. On a night that felt like compensation from the football gods for all of the years of pain and misery at Hillsborough though, Sheffield Wednesday staged one of the most remarkable comebacks in the history of the English game. Four goals, the last of which came in the eighth minute of injury time, took the match to extra time, where Peterborough United scored their first goal of the night to go 5-4 up on aggregate just for added drama. Eight minutes from time, Wednesday went level, and five flawless penalties secured their place in the playoff final at Wembley Stadium. The final, in its own way, was almost as dramatic. Despite playing almost an hour of football against ten men, Wednesday couldn't break down their South Yorkshire rivals Barnsley. Until the 123rd minute, that is, when Josh Windass popped up with a header to take Wednesday back into the championship. For just a brief moment, all was well in the world for Sheffield Wednesday fans. It didn't take long for that optimism to be shattered. Ten days after the playoff final, Sheffield Wednesday's experienced head of recruitment, Bobby Downs, left the club to take up the same role at Blackpool in League One. It didn't bode particularly well for Wednesday, with little suggestion that Downs had been forced out. As the club looked to prepare for life in the championship, for which serious reinforcements would be required, his replacement wouldn't be appointed for over a month. It left Wednesday floundering in the transfer market, but Downs' departure was small fry compared to what was about to come. Three weeks after the playoff final, and less than two weeks after Downs left, Darren Moore followed him out the door. Moore had his critics during his time at Hillsborough, particularly following the 4-0 defeat in the playoff semi-final first leg, but given the club's points tally and the manner in which they had navigated the playoffs, his departure came as a major shock to both Wednesday fans and the wider football community. In response to the backlash, Dapon Chanceri claimed that Moore demanded four times his League One salary to manage the club in the championship. Having remained silent up to that point, at the end of August, Moore denied that money was the reason for his exit in an interview with Sky Sports, citing a difference in time scales and visions. He didn't go into any more detail than that, though it was widely reported that Moore didn't feel Chancery's commitment in terms of recruitment and spending would allow Wednesday to compete in the championship. Chancery denied both of these claims, reaffirming, via official club channels, that it was all about Moore's wage demands. He did provide some insight into his aims or expectations though, and perhaps why Moore might have found them a little bit unrealistic without significant recruitment, stating, when asked about his aims this season, that his minimum expectation was qualifying for the playoffs. Presumably, if that was the minimum, his median expectation was the league title, followed by Champions League qualification the season after that, Barry Bannon winning the Ballon d'Or, and Wednesday winning the Super Bowl. In Moore's place, Wednesday appointed Cisco Munoz. From Chancery's perspective, it made perfect sense. He wanted Premier League promotion, and Munoz is a man with a promotion on his CV, having taken Watford up as championship runners-up in the 2020-21 season. Sure, he only lasted 10 months at Watford and was sacked after just seven Premier League matches, but that's just what Watford do. 
More concerning, perhaps, was the fact that in his two jobs since leaving Watford, Munoz had struggled at second-tier Huesca in Spain, and with an orthosis Famagusta in Cyprus, failing to win more than a third of his games or stick around for more than eight months at either club. Just in case Munoz didn't know what he was getting into already, at the press conference in which his arrival was announced, Chancery decided to go on a massive rant about Carlton Palmer who played for Wednesday in the late 80s, early 90s, and very briefly on loan in the early 2000s, because Palmer had criticised the way in which the club was being run. Of course, by making a press conference about a new managerial appointment all about your own personal grievances, with the comments of someone who played for the club 30 years ago, Chancery definitely hadn't, in a microcosm, just proven Palmer's point. By the time Munoz was appointed, Wednesday had made just one summer signing. Reese James, no, not that one, for an undisclosed fee from Blackpool. At the opposite end, 18 players had been released, including seven first-team players who played a part in the Owls' promotion-winning campaign last season. Wednesday left it late to kick into action in the transfer market, but eventually six new players came in. Only two of them, Dijon Bernard and Bambo Diaby, had experience playing in English football. Plus James. Meanwhile, sporting Hihon right back Paul Valentin and PSG winger Jedi Gassama were the only two signed for fees. A further five players, meanwhile, including two deadline day arrivals, were brought in on loan. Despite Dapon Chancery's playoff ambitions, this season was always going to be an uphill battle for Wednesday. But even then, Munoz's reign got off to a markedly unusual start. Marvin Johnson, who was a key man for Wednesday under Darren Moore last season, scoring three goals and hitting double figures in terms of assists, predominantly from left wing back, was frozen out in mysterious circumstances, owing to an alleged fallout with the new Owls boss. The 32-year-old, who has more championship experience than most in the Wednesday squad, wasn't even named in the club's 25-man squad for the current campaign. Meanwhile, summer arrival Momo Diabe was also left out after he picked up a nasty injury on his debut against Preston North End. Earlier this week, Johnson shared a photograph on Instagram which showed him training alone in Dubai with an individual fitness coach. The decision to exile Johnson is one which appears particularly strange in light of new left-back Reese James also not having been involved, with centre-back Aken Famiwo having been shoehorned in at left-back instead. That decision is one which Munoz was repeatedly asked questions about by reporters and fans, growing increasingly frustrated when it was asked after almost every one of his 10 games in charge. In fairness, it might have been asked less if he ever actually took a stab at answering it, but Munoz appeared to adopt a fairly abrasive approach with journalists and supporters from day one. He likely would have had a fair bit of sympathy from supporters this season, given the circumstances he inherited, but he appeared to be a broken man by about the third or fourth game of the season, and following Wednesday's most recent defeat on Tuesday night against West Brom, it seemed as though he had given up and was almost asking the club to sack him. Chancery's announcement that he would be putting no additional money into the club led to some doubts about whether the Thai air would actually pull the trigger, but ultimately, he has a rapidly depreciating asset with ever-increasing liabilities to protect, and Wednesday's next six fixtures constitute probably the most winnable run that they will have all season. Fail to win at least a couple of those games, and they are as good as down already. And late on Wednesday evening, Munoz was sacked. At the time of this recording, his successor hasn't yet been announced. The name that is being banded about most heavily, again, at the time of this recording, and things can change mightily quickly in football, is 74-year-old Neil Warnock. Warnock, ironically enough, left Huddersfield Town just a couple of weeks ago, where he was replaced by former Wednesday boss Darren Moore. Warnock previously spent eight years in charge of Wednesday's bitter Steel City rivals, Sheffield United, which has made him an unpopular candidate when linked with the Wednesday job in the past. Now there is a feeling that, of the available options, as a short-term punt to keep the club in the division, they could do an awful lot worse. 
Warnock performed miracles at Huddersfield last season, and having looked a little left field with Munoz, which couldn't really have gone any worse, at least Wednesday would know what they were getting into bed with with Warnock, a man who knows the championship better than Steve Evans knows the inside of his local chip shop. The truth, however, is that whoever replaces Munoz, whilst they might not be as spectacularly useless, and appear quite so irritated to be asked any questions about why they just got battered 3-0 after every game, they will inherit the exact same problems. Sheffield Wednesday's current plight long predates not just Cisco Munoz, but also Darren Moore. Moore did an excellent job in terms of getting results at Wednesday last season, but as important, if not even more so, was his ability to unite the club and bring about a sense of togetherness that had been absent for all too long. Daypon Chanceri is someone who doesn't tend to delegate, and it is said that virtually nothing gets signed off on at Hillsborough, even when Chanceri is in Thailand, without the owner's permission. That makes everything quite slow, disorganised and laborious, and within the world of football, there has long been a perception that the club is a bit of a circus. Fans know it, journalists know it, but worse still, players and agents know it, and that can make signing players a whole lot more difficult. Daypon Chanseri is the son of Chrysorn Chanseri, an 88-year-old multi-millionaire Thai businessman who founded and is still the chairman of the Thai Union Group. Thai Union specialise in chilled, frozen and canned seafood products, owning major brands like John West, Chicken of the Sea, and the restaurant chain Red Lobster, and they are said to be the world's largest canned or tin tuna providers. It is a profitable old business, raking in around $4 billion a year in revenue and around $200 million in profit. The family as a whole has an estimated net worth of $575 million according to Forbes, but Daypon isn't actually involved in the senior management at Thai Union, possibly for obvious reasons, given the way in which he has run a football club, with his elder brother Thirupong Chanseri having been the company's president and CEO since his father stepped down in 1990, over 30 years ago. Prior to acquiring Sheffield Wednesday, Chanseri is reported to have had little to no interest in football, nor any experience working within the sport. Perhaps it would be cruel to suggest that it shows, oh well, I suppose I've said it now. According to some reports, Chanseri's own teenage son, who is said to be passionate about football, was instrumental in him becoming involved in the sport, and has even been involved in key decisions taken by the club. Commenting on how he got the Sheffield Wednesday job in 2015, in an interview with Yorkshire Live a few years ago, Portuguese head coach Carlos Carvajal stated, quote, I did the interview, I was chosen, and months later, I came to know who had the last word on my hiring was the son of the chairman, who would be 10 or 11 years old. Carvajal then laughed. He had seen some things on the internet, some press releases in Turkey, and some games. The purest reality. The decision of a 10-year-old kid opened the door for my life's challenge, and at that moment, I felt that I was starting my career seriously. End quote. It is a funny anecdote for Carvajal, who turned out to be Chanceri's best appointment, but it is potentially a pretty terrifying way in which to run a multi-million pound business, and it is not an isolated example. Chanceri, despite acknowledging his lack of expertise when it comes to football, has been reluctant throughout his time owning Sheffield Wednesday to have too many directors or executives, if any, getting in between him and the manager. And again, it shows. Even when Wednesday qualified for the championship playoffs in successive seasons, in Chanceri's first two seasons in South Yorkshire, their recruitment was scattergun to say the least. There was little rhyme or reason in terms of a way of playing or profile of player, aside from signing a load of established, often older championship players, typically on very high wages. In his first three seasons at Hillsborough, Chanceri twice broke the club's transfer record, most notably with the arrival of Jordan Rhodes, for a seriously chunky £8 million fee from Middlesbrough. Rhodes had only scored six goals in 26 games for Borough, and just three in 20 on loan at Wednesday, but as part of that loan deal, Chanceri had agreed to sign the striker for a club record-breaking fee. 
Rhodes went on to score 15 goals in 83 games over three seasons at Hillsborough before leaving for nothing, which is how almost everyone has left the club since Chancery arrived. And I'm really not exaggerating. In fact, in the entire time that Chancery has owned the club, spanning more than eight years, Wednesday have only received transfer fees for seven players. In the last four transfer windows, Wednesday have generated a grand total of zero pounds and zero pence in transfer revenue. Lucas Joao is the only man to have left the club for a really significant fee during Chancery's reign, and that was over four years ago. Even with Joao's £5 million sale to Reading, Wednesday haven't come close to generating £10 million in total in player sales during Chancery's eight years in charge. Compare that to a club like Middlesbrough, who have generated over £150 million, Hull City, who have made more than £130 million, or even Barnsley, who have still raked in four times as much as Wednesday during that time, and whilst Chancery has sunk a lot of his own money into the club, as he complained about in his recent statement to the club's fans, and that brought him some time and sympathy from a lot of Wednesday fans, a lot of those losses are really no one's fault other than his own. In a league where player sales are vital to running an even remotely sustainable business, those numbers are a dire indictment of the way in which Chancery has run the club. Most remarkably of all though, Wednesday's almost total lack of transfer revenue was reportedly by design. One unnamed player told The Athletic a couple of years ago, quote, You'd stay at the club until your contract was up. That was notoriously how Chancery did things. End quote. Virtually every club in the EFL loses money, even the wiliest of operators within the transfer market, but there is losing money, and then there is Elon Musk buying Twitter losing money, and Chancery's time at Wednesday has fallen dangerously close to the latter in terms of incompetence and economic mismanagement. During his early years at the club, Chancery looked to offset his spending by any means necessary with some players reportedly paid as much as £25,000 to £30,000 a week, putting Wednesday's wage bill right among the highest outside of the relegated clubs in the championship, significant losses were inevitable, at least without the club gaining promotion. Three of Wednesday's most prominent sponsors when Chancery arrived were companies with very close ties to the man himself. The most brazen was Wednesday's shirt sponsors, which was simply the word Chancery. According to The Guardian, whilst Chancery did have a registered company named Chancery Limited with a registered address at Hillsborough, its accounts showed that it was dormant, meaning that it wasn't trading, and according to sources close to the club, the Chancery sponsorship was literally a case of the owner paying to put his own surname on the front of the club's shirts, rather than any commercial deal with an active company. Another of Wednesday's sponsors and exclusive shirt manufacturers, Elevate, was owned by Chancery, and Chancery also owns a company called Elevate Energy Drink Limited. Meanwhile, D Taxis, a mysterious supposed Sheffield based taxi firm owned by Chancery, was the club's third owner link sponsors. Between them, in 2019, they were reportedly putting more than £1 million a year into the club, which is a lot of money, but only about enough to cover the wages of one of the club's top earners at the time. In July 2019, therefore, Chancery did what all self-respecting, free-spending championship owners do at some stage, and bought the club's stadium off them for £60 million, looking to exploit a loophole to prevent the team from breaching spending rules, which they would otherwise have broken. To say that it didn't work would be a pretty major understatement. The sale went through after the relevant accounting period, and so in November 2019, Wednesday were charged by the EFL for exceeding spending regulations by £18 million, and an independent panel eventually gave the club a 12-point deduction. That was reduced to six points upon appeal, but it was little use. By this stage, Wednesday were almost as big of a mess on the pitch as they were off it, going through three different managers, Gary Monk, Tony Pulis, and eventually Darren Moore, before being relegated following a dramatic final day of the 2020-21 season. 
Relegation to League One meant a further reduction in Wednesday's revenue, and a soft embargo from the FL prevented the club from actually paying transfer fees to sign any players, restricting them exclusively to free transfers and loan signings, which might actually have been doing them a favour under Chancery. To plug the gap, and with the suspicious sponsors and stadium sale not having worked, or certainly not able to be replicated at least, Chancery turned instead to his favourite cash cow of all, Sheffield Wednesday supporters, and began milking them so furiously that Peter had to get involved. In truth, Chancery has always appeared to view Wednesday fans through that lens, chiefly as a money-making tool. But in recent years, it has become so much more brazen. This season, ticket prices rose at Hillsborough yet again to levels so high that they received national attention. An adult's ticket in the club's south stand for a Category A game this season is priced at an eye-watering £59 and £49 for concessions. Even for a Category G game, the lowest price bracket and priority fixtures, prices start at £27 for adults in the COP and rise to £36 in the South Stand. Season tickets, meanwhile, range from £595 to £825 for adults, depending upon where you want to sit, and even under 25 season tickets are priced between £390 to £560. To give confused non-UK viewers a bit of context, or perhaps just any of you who are unfamiliar with championship ticket prices, I pay £35 a month for my whole city season ticket, or £420 a season, and that is the most expensive season ticket at Hull City for an adult. The cheapest is £300 for adults, £102 for young adults, and free for juniors under the age of 10. Sheffield Wednesday's season and matchday tickets are by far the most expensive in the championship to watch the worst team in the division in what is a low-income city currently in the grips of a brutal cost-of-living crisis. It is, quite literally, cheaper to watch the reigning treble winners Manchester City compete in the UEFA Champions League an hour away than it is to watch Sheffield Wednesday get pumped every week in the second tier of English football. If football fandom didn't have such a profound ability to play upon people's emotions and to convince them with their hard-earned cash, Hillsborough would be empty every week. Chancery is relying on a significant number of Sheffield Wednesday fans, who can afford to, by hook or by crook, continuing to attend games. And by and large, that is exactly what has happened. Wednesday's crowds still aren't where they could or should be. They haven't averaged over 28,000 of their home games over the course of a season since the 1997-98 campaign, when Paolo Di Canio was their top scorer. But an average of 25,719 this season is still their eighth highest in the championship so far this term, and it is more than six Premier League teams. Given Wednesday's current plight, and the ticket prices, that is pretty remarkable. And it is fairly unedifying for a multi-millionaire heir to his father's fortune to speak about not being able to reduce ticket prices and merchandise prices because not enough fans attend games or buy things from the club shop, exactly as Chancery did in his most recent statement. Of course, if Sheffield Wednesday shirts, match day, and season tickets were all oversubscribed, I'm 100% sure that Chancery would be rushing to reduce the prices, as he claims, rather than hiking them even further to try and find supporters' breaking points. In his most recent statement, and there have been lots of them, Chancery had the gall to ask Sheffield Wednesday supporters what they have ever done for the club, accusing those who criticise him of being against the club as a whole, and calling upon those who would like to see him gone to buy the club off him themselves. Everything about that statement, and Chancery's broader pettiness, incompetence and spite, basically stating that he is going to remove funding and deliberately harm Sheffield Wednesday, because the supporters said mean things about him, gave me flashbacks to the Alam's ownership of Hull City. The Alams were, if anything, even more tone deaf at times, as Sam Alam once telling supporters that they could quote, die as soon as they want, in response to fans chanting City Till I Die, after his failed attempt to change the club's name, for example. For all of their faults though, the Alams protected their investment relatively well. 
and though their lack of investment in of itself took the club from the Premier League down to League One, its sustainable financial footing meant that its fundamental existence was never threatened, and it remained a relatively attractive proposition to potential new owners. The same cannot be said of Sheffield Wednesday. Chancery slashed Wednesday's operating expenses by 37% in the 2021-22 season, as per the club's most recent set of published accounts, as revenue rose by 40%, despite relegation to League One due to stadiums reopening post-COVID-19. Nonetheless, all that did was reduce the amount of money that the club was losing, recording a pre-tax loss of £7.3 million, down from £25.8 million the previous year. It is an absolutely eye-watering statistic that, in the 2020-21 season, Sheffield Wednesday spent 209% of their revenue on wages alone, during a season in which they still finish bottom of the championship, illustrating both the suicidal way in which the club has been run, but also how dependent they were, and still are, on matchday revenue as their primary source of income. In 2022, Wednesday's net debt rose to £62.4 million, dwarfing the £20 million debt that saw the club face a series of winding up orders before Milan Mandric took over in late 2010. Without wanting to sound too alarmist, I don't think that a lot of people have quite grasped the full extent of Sheffield Wednesday's current plight. Dapon Chancery paid £37.5 million to acquire Sheffield Wednesday, £60 million to buy Hillsborough from the club, and Wednesday have still lost more than £130 million since he arrived, racking up debts of over £60 million. Chancery says that he is willing to entertain offers for the club, but no right-minded individual would offer him any more than taking the burden of Wednesday's already enormous liabilities off his hands, leaving Chancery, after over eight years, with absolutely nothing. For a wealthy heir, not involved in the senior management of the family business, it would be a damning indictment of his business acumen and an act of humiliation, but what other choice has he got? The Chanceries are wealthy, but not wealthy enough to let Dapon sink an endless stream of cash into a bottomless pit of stupidity, and the family's net worth is already reported to have fallen by more than 20% since 2019, and 17% since Dapon bought Wednesday in 2015. That's why, even if Wednesday nail Cisco Munoz's replacement and somehow manage to survive in the championship this season, which is unlikely, let's just say, that will barely scratch the surface in terms of rectifying the avalanche of problems that the club currently faces. This season, Chancery, who considered the playoffs to be a minimum expectation, relaunched his innovative 10-year season ticket, priced between five and a half to eight thousand pounds, which only begin counting down your 10 years once the club reaches the Premier League. 10-year season tickets can't be purchased via debit or credit card for some reason, only by cash, check, or invoice. It is hard to imagine a more farcical image or fitting metaphor, which better sums up the mess that Sheffield Wednesday are currently in, than a supporter being asked to bring £8,000 in a wheelbarrow full of cash to Hillsborough to buy a 10-year season ticket in order to plug the gaping holes in the club's finances caused by Chancery, which only starts counting down once the club reaches the Premier League, as they currently sit bottom of the championship following their worst start to a football league season in over 130 years, and the joint worst in the entire history of the championship. Wednesday will never die, in the truest sense of the term at least, even if the club were one day liquidated. Their support is such that they would eventually rise from the ashes, but at some point, a club of Wednesday's stature is going to drop out of the EFL or be liquidated. There was a time when that prospect would have raised alarm bells throughout the English game. Now it feels inevitable, greeted with almost a shrug of the shoulders, and an oh well. In 2022, Oldham became the first former Premier League club to drop out of the league system as a whole. Meanwhile, Scunthorpe and Southend United very nearly went to the wall this week, the latest in a long line. 
The Premier League is the richest league in world football, by far, but the rest of the English game, despite being the best supported and most vibrant league ecosystem on the planet, is in dire financial health. And without a miraculous and, as yet, inconceivable turnaround in fortunes, Sheffield Wednesday might be the next club to find themselves on life support. And on that light note, that is it for today's video. Thank you all very much, as ever, for watching. Hit the like button if you enjoyed it. Let me know your thoughts down below in the comments. I would imagine you didn't enjoy it too much if you're a Wednesday fan, but apologies. There's nothing I can do other than tell the story as it is. Uh, and of course, uh, make sure that you are subscribed and have notifications turned on for both this channel, HITC7s, and also my second channel, Alfie Potts Armour, both of which should be on or about to appear on your screens now, along with a couple of videos that you might fancy watching after this one, if you're not sick of my voice. It's been a while, so I would understand if you were. Uh, you can also find me on Twitter, Instagram, or threads via the username at HITC7s on all three. And I will leave all of those links plus a whole lot more down in the video description below. Cheers.